is a special edition of our Campus Conversations for Santa Barbara City College Foundation. We're going to give folks just a few minutes to come on in and get settled, and then we'll begin our program shortly. Thank you all for taking the time. Welcome folks, as everyone uh, joins us, we're uh, just taking a few minutes to let everybody into the program and we will get started in just one moment. Thank you so much for joining us today. Watching those attendee numbers tick up, which is what we like to see. All right, well, we're about five minutes after, so I will go ahead and officially start our program. Uh, my name is Jeff Green. I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of our Santa Barbara City College Foundation. Uh, and of course, we're here as a partner to the college to support all the wonderful work that happens at the college, uh, to support our students in their various paths, and uh, of course, to raise resources to make all of that possible. So we've been doing these campus conversations since the onset of the pandemic, uh, originally called COVID Conversations. And we found them to be a, a wonderful way to connect our community and our college. Uh, today, we have a special session. Uh, it is probably not an understatement to say that we are in the midst of one of the more chaotic uh, and unusual election seasons of, uh, of our lifetimes. Uh, and, and one concern that comes up in a time like that is that local races, down ballot races, especially for specific districts, uh, sometimes get, get short shrift in, uh, in the media and attention. Uh, but they are every bit as important, and in some cases, the, the most important, depending on what your issues and concerns uh, are and how you're connected to our community. So we thought this would be a good time to uplift one of those races, uh, actually three of those races. That is the races, uh, those are the races for the seats on the Board of Trustees of the Santa Barbara Community College District uh, in California with our 73 community college districts and our 116 campuses and the largest higher ed system in the Western world. Uh, each of those district boards is elected locally. And of course, for us, that is a seven member board with a student trustee as well. Uh, and it is a district election. So today, we are going to hear from the two candidates for each of three races uh, that are up for the November 3rd ballot. Now, I know some people have already voted. Hopefully, if you're with us today, uh, you have some curiosity still about these races. Uh, and we've structured this in a slightly different way that you might otherwise see. And that is that we are going to go two by two through each of the three races, uh, giving approximately 25 to 30 minutes to each race, rather than having all six candidates on the screen at the same time. We're gonna use the wonders of Zoom webinar uh, to allow two candidates at a time to speak with you. And if you know what district you're in, you know which section uh, might be most relevant for you. You're welcome to join us for the whole time, however. Uh, we are not going to be taking questions from participants this time, and that is strictly a matter of logistics. Some of you did submit questions or areas of interest in advance, and I appreciate that, um, but I will be asking questions. We will probably not cover everything. We know that is the case uh, by definition, uh, but we're going to do our best, and uh, we have some folks that are very deeply invested in our community college and the district and our larger community as well here with us today. Uh, for those of you that miss it or want to see it again or you want to tell friends about it, we do record these. It is recording now and we will in fact post this on the sbccfoundation.org website, sbccfoundation.org. Uh, so with that, by way of introduction, I want to start us off. Uh, let me let you know the way we're going to run this today. We are going to have area two first and I'll introduce our candidates in just a moment. You see them right there on the screen. We're gonna follow that with area three. The candidates there are Veronica Gallardo, the incumbent, and Aaron Gurenya. And then area four, uh, and the two candidates there for the open seat uh, being vacated by Craig Nielsen are Celeste Barber and Anna Everett. So that's how we're gonna do it in 30 minute sections. Uh, but to start with, we are in area two. And in area two, I'm very happy to welcome to the screen uh, two candidates. Uh, we have the incumbent current president of the board, Robert Miller. Uh, and we have the challenger, uh, Ron, Lichty, who is joining us today as well. Um, both are uh, very passionate about this work and both are gonna have the opportunity to tell you why. So to start off with, we're gonna give each candidate a three minute opportunity for an opening statement. Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, I wanna thank you and the foundation for hosting this forum. It's our second opportunity during this election season to discuss the issues facing uh, SBCC. We appreciate the opportunity to present our positions to the community through this medium. With that introduction, I want to say that I seek re-election to represent the leader on the Board of Trustees because in my view, community colleges perform a critical role 
in reversing the widening equity, wage, and achievement gaps in this country. And I want to help SBCC do its part. SBCC welcomes all students, no matter their background. It aims to help every student succeed, especially students from disadvantaged, marginalized, and unrepresented backgrounds, many of whom represent the first generation in their family to attend college. SBCC is a tremendous resource to our community, and I want it to remain so. It provides a skilled workforce for our local economy, provides opportunities for affordable, quality education and training to everyone in our community, whether seeking an AA certificate, pursuing a path to a four-year college, improving vocational opportunities, enhancing life skills, or seeking a GED. Last year as board president, I led the effort to find and hire an interim uh, superintendent president in the campus and community process to select a permanent replacement. Our new CEO, Dr. Utpal Goswami, began in January of this year and almost immediately faced financial and operational challenges due to COVID-19. Under his leadership and support from a first-class faculty and staff, we successfully transitioned to online instruction and began work on strategy to survive the financial shortfalls caused by the pandemic and associated economic impacts. We now face additional financial challenges due to a significant decline in enrollment from out of state and international students, also due to COVID-19. At our board meeting last week, the, door, the board adopted its goals for 2021. And the, first, the very first goal states that we want a balanced budget within two years. That will require a heavy lift by the administration as it already has projected a $4.9 million deficit this year, primarily due to the effects of COVID-19. But I'm confident that Dr. Gaswami and his administration have the knowledge and skills to get it done. Indeed, at the same board meeting last week, Dr. Gaswami outlined his plan for making the strategic cuts to achieve the, the goal we have set for him. Prior to our meeting, we had already started the important task of meeting with constituent. He had already started the important task of meeting with constituent groups on campus to discuss his strategy and seek their input. <laughs> I know the board looks forward to working Dr. Gos with Dr. Goswami on this critically important task. I look forward to doing my part to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, Mr. Lichty, the floor is yours, sir, for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. Uh, thank you and you and the foundation for hosting this. And I say hello to all of our viewers now and the ones that are watching even on recorded time. I am Ron Lichty. And I just want you to know that I care about this college, this community, and all the people connected to it. And I really stand for and dedicated to the opportunity, equality, and success for every student that's uh, going there. Um, like my neighbors and friends and colleagues, I believe in public education. I'm a product of public education myself, and I'm grateful for all the opportunities it's provided me. And um, so I'm a civically minded individual and I was asked uh, by some uh, neighbors and other parents to uh, run for office when they noticed that the um, seat was going unchallenged at the time. And so I put together a campaign and here we are. Um, as your trustee, I'd like to tap my energy and skills and professional experience to ensure that uh, this institution remains a first class institution as we've come to know it. Um, about my qualifications, well, number one, um, I'm connected to the college because I'm a parent and I've already had a son that has gone to uh, SBCC. He's earned three associate degrees and was able to transfer to UCSB successfully. Um, uh, my wife, uh, back in the day, she actually graduated Santa Barbara High School and she went to Santa Barbara City College as well and went on to Santa Cruz. And our daughter is in high school now and is looking into the dual enrollment program. So I've been a community member for around 30 years and working uh, full time the entire time. And I'm a, I'm a, my professional experience is I'm a finance and management person. I graduated with a degree in accounting, earned my CPA certificate, and have been working for the last 23 years for actually for the city of Santa Barbara. I spent a dozen years in the finance department and now I've been uh, 12 years over there in uh, public safety in the fire department, uh, running the administration and uh, uh, office there for the fire department. 
So um, I have a really un impeccable uh, record of public service as a city official. Uh, I've met all fiduciary responsibilities and I've been in service to the public um, as its trustee already uh, for many years. Uh, I've been involved in numerous steering committees and past executive boards already in my career. Uh, currently I'm volunteering for the um, Santa Barbara Unified School District's Citizens Bond Oversight Committee something that may come up uh, with, uh, with the Santa Barbara City College where we be, will be looking at offering a bond to the, to the citizens uh, for capital improvements. I've also been a past president of the um, Administrative Fire Service section of the California Fire Chiefs Association. I served on that executive board for three years. And I'm also a, right now the membership coordinator and just as example of one of my successes or our successes is that our membership was declining, our enrollment was declining. And uh, I put through some innovative strategies to um, put some targets out there to increase membership. And we actually su succeeded and exceeded our goal of 25% and actually collected another 36% more members in one year's trying. So I have a record of, of taking systems and, and improving them. We're a little past the three minute mark. So actually we're gonna go into some of that. Do you have a couple more things you'd like to- Oh, I just want to actually introduce myself. So that's, that's fine. Thank you so much. Okay. Jeff. All right, thank you. Well, we're gonna take a, a, a hint from one of your recent comments here. So we're gonna first dive into the, to the budget question. It's no secret that budgets in public institutions are always a challenge. Um, and you've both got experience in this, in this realm in different ways. Uh, and so, so let's actually, I'm going I'm to continue with you, uh, Mr. Lichty, about, about budget philosophy. So the question before us today is that we've got, uh, as you saw the most recently, about a $4.9 million projected budget deficit. It's vacillated between a couple million and over 10, depending on what the state might do or the federal government might do. Um, how do you weigh uh, all of the different factors that go into balancing a budget? And, and some of the ones I'd like to hear you address are, yeah, first of all, we have a shared governance system, so you know, it's are set by the trustees, but there is a process. Uh, bonds, of course, there's a history of both success and failure with bonds for us. Uh, enrollment has a, a, is a factor in, in revenue for the college. Uh, and of course, you know, as is philanthropy and, and other things. So what, what, how do you think through a budget deficit of the kind that we're doing? And how, what would your analysis be to, to bring us forward? Okay, well, how I look at it, you know, just to begin with, is the budget is it's two things. It's revenues and expenditures. And the revenues are driven by enrollment primarily. Philanthropy is part of that. And the expenditures that we've learned um, over the uh, last uh, years is that 90% of the expenditures for Santa Barbara's budget is salaries and benefits. So um, over the, and they've recognized this and, and, at the same time, so I look at, at that and it's, it's difficult because people's wages, their salaries are dependent on working at the institution. And when we're talking about resizing, maybe downsizing to, uh, to, because of the enrollment numbers, it may be affecting people's uh, jobs. So I've lived through and worked through uh, similar financial circumstances. We had the Great Recession in 2000 eight through 2010, I was working for the city of Santa Barbara and we approached it in a number of ways. There were employee givebacks, the, the uh, deferred uh, compensation raises, uh, there, uh, people went on um, some leave and we uh, budget balanced by, um, by attrition as well. And I know a lot of those things have been used already uh, at, the, at the Santa Barbara City College. But I'd be looking at uh, those salaries and benefits my philosophy as far as this is a participatory shared government. So I really would be looking to the other organizations, the other committees, and what do they share? What do they bring to the table when they look at their own shops and what can they do to possibly reduce their expenditures and possibly increase their revenues as well? The, the trends recently have been that uh, enrollment over the last 10 years has actually decreased for various reasons, about 25%. At the same time, staff and faculty have only decreased by about from three to 7%. So that's where we're getting our, um, our budget deficit, our, our instability. So there's, there's lots of um, monies to be saved. We see in the current budget proposal, uh, budget efficiencies, there's efficiencies that can be gained. And I'd be looking to working on that as well. So that's my answer for now. Thank you.
Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, how about you? How do you see all those countervailing forces uh, figuring into your philosophy of how you balance a budget in a, in a time like this? Well, first of all, let me say that there's probably no more important uh, task that the board has than, than uh, fiscal uh, stability, fiscal sustainability. And that's clearly what we're focused on in a big way at, at the current time. And I would just note again that when the board established its goals, and uh, which we worked on for several several months, uh, the first goal that we uh, we adopted last last week was we need to balance our budget in two years, and we, at the same time we need to uh, maintain our prudent reserves. Those are two uh, seemingly contradictory goals, but both very important goals. And I'm confident that Dr. under Dr. Goswami's uh, leadership we can achieve that. But for, we need to understand how we got here. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were already, uh, I think I would describe on a uh, upward trend in, a, in dealing with our uh, structural deficit. And then along came COVID-19, uh, resulting in a loss of uh, state funding. And then to compound that, we had a significant drop in international students that probably cost us in the range of four and a half million dollars. And from out of state students, another two, $2.1 million. We're hoping we can restore those numbers. We probably can't get back to the numbers we had uh, before in terms of enrollment, but uh, certainly it's our goal to, uh, to, try to try to get some of those numbers uh, uh, back. So how do you go about trying to find out, uh, or trying to go about uh, attacking the, uh, the deficit? I think probably nothing is off the table, but we start, we start with the recognition that 90% 90% of our expenditures are personnel related. The other 10% are, are operational expenses and we've been uh, working hard at trying to, uh, to cut any unnecessary uh, uh, expenses out of the operational budget, but there isn't much more room or hardly any place else we can go. So we, we can't avoid uh, dealing, with, uh, dealing with personnel. We wanna maintain our, our high quality uh, instruction we want to maintain our high quality staff. We want to maintain our high quality student services. And so as we, as we approach the uh, uh, budget in a shared go governance way, in the way that's already uh, begun, we have to recognize that at that, that 90%. Dr. Uh, Gazwami outlined uh, for us at our last meeting, uh, several uh, what he called stabilization actions they don't, they don't identify specific amounts or, um, or uh, areas in the budget that will be cut, but, but rather uh, broad areas. And, and uh, I, I think that those, are the, those are the kind of, uh, those are the kind of uh, uh, cuts and uh, analysis that's gonna have to go forward. I don't think we can make any decisions until there's been an opportunity to discuss this in further detail with uh, the other constituent groups on campus. But uh, I think the board has great confidence in Dr. Gazwami to, uh, to get to that goal that we've set for him of a balanced budget in, uh, in uh, two years. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. So I wanna to switch uh, topics now to another uh, very, very hot topic. And this is one that has, uh, has stretched back in time uh, long before the current moment. But I do wanna flag that the context of my question is gonna be around uh, equity writ large, but specifically racial justice uh, and, and all of the, the movements that have really uh, come to the forefront since the murder of George Floyd. And you've seen uh, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and a whole range of movements that are really focused on uh, racial equity in the United States. Now, some of these are very broad uh, nationwide uh, analyses, and some are very specific and localized. And I, I'd like to hear from each of you sort of how you fall on that spectrum. I, I would think it's fair to say that um, no one would, would argue against the need for equity and, and being a welcoming place and that SBCC should be accessible to everyone. I, I, I'm gonna take for granted that that's a starting point. Um, but then there are different types of analyses. So uh, I'd just like to hear you talk through what you see as the, the problem, but then also the role of the institution in solving that or reacting uh, and I, I think the boundaries I'll draw on the question would be um, from, from basic equity and access all the way to uh, issues of, of structural oppression and racism and, and white supremacy, which, you know, that's, that's the, the full scope of what we've been, um, been trying to address, at least in conversation, if not policy. 
Uh, can you each comment on, on your, your analysis of what you think the challenges are and then what you think the role of the institution is in addressing, addressing those issues? And I know this is a PhD thesis and a seven week conference and I'm trying to cram it into two minutes each, but I'd, I'd like you to give our audience a taste of your, your perspective. Uh, we can start with you, Mr. Lichty. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, it's a difficult subject for me to approach because I am a white Christian, you know, elder male. And uh, what I'm learning from, I've, I've done a lot of, you know, reading and I've actually gone to some workshops on equity and discrimination. And what I have to say, people don't want to hear, I think, because of my identity. I can't walk in the shoes of a black man or a black woman or a lesbian or, or any of the different sectionalities that we have. So I can always say that my grounding is, um, I grew up in the 60s and I grew up with Martin Luther King. And he said, judge a person, as we all know, by the content of their character, not by their skin color, not by the color of skin. And we have a proposition to our constitution that all of our trustees have to adhere to. And it's 37 words that say the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to an individual group or on the basis of race, sex, color, identity, or national origin in the public operation of employment, public education, or contracting. It seems pretty simple to me that we don't do those things. Um, what else to say about it? Uh, I, so I believe that we should judge by merit and I don't know what the access issues are at Santa Barbara City College. It's open to all. Everybody's given, uh, if they need help, they're given the help. And so I really think that, um, well, I want everyone to feel welcome, just like we were saying. And I'm not sure what else to, that I can explore on that subject. Okay. There's no there's no room for discrimination uh, on campus. People should not be um, there should not be there should be no bigotry and our policies. I know being a trustee is part of a team and we create policies together for the enhancement of the students' success in their education, whatever their education is. And that's what I believe. In. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm going to circle back with a, a follow up question to both of you, but let me let me give you, Mr. Miller, a chance to respond then in, in kind. Uh, and again, it's sort of a two-part question. One is how how you view the, the challenge and what you know what uh, terminology, description, where on the spectrum you fall with respect to how you would give the analysis of what what the issue is, and then secondarily, what the, the role of the institution in that context may be. I start uh, I start with the recognition that racism uh, still exists. <laughs> And it, it exists in probably every major institution in, in this country. It, it exists in our, in our population. And if, if, if one uh, disagrees with that concept, I would ask them just to look at what has happened in this country in the past uh, four or five months since the George Floyd uh, murder in, in, in Minneapolis. We, we didn't need that incident to tell us that racism uh, is alive. We didn't need that incident to tell us that, that uh, African Americans and blacks in this country uh, face a different experience when they interact with, with the police. We, we've all read about incidents that, that long preceded the George, the George Floyd uh, murder. So I start with, this, with that recognition that racism still exists. So what do we do? What can we do at Santa Barbara City College about that? There's been a lot of things going on at, at Santa Barbara City College, including um, uh, anti-racism uh, training, uh, sensitivity training concerning uh, uh, making people more aware of how Blacks and African Americans and persons of color uh, live their lives. And no, we can't walk in. We we can't walk in their shoes, but we can listen. And we can try to understand. We can do that through personal conversations. We can do that through reading. We can do that with interacting with with people who who live uh, racism on, on a daily uh, basis. 
So I was, I was pleased that after the George Floyd killing, our board was able to come together and pass a resolution that, that adopted uh, seven action items to, to address uh, anti-racism and equity uh, on campus. And we have asked the administration to implement those actions and they're in the process of it uh, right now. Uh, probably one of the most important is the establishment of a task force to look at all of our policies and procedures with an equity and anti-racism lens to see whether changes uh, can be made. There are a number, number of other action, six other action items that I won't go through at the moment, but we're going to be monitoring those, those efforts very closely. The administration is going to be reporting back to us. But I think they're very important. Uh, over a majority of students at Santa Barbara City College are persons of color, and I think we owe them an obligation to, to attack uh, racism uh, head on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I, I, uh, I, I want to jump to a, a, a different issue, although it's not unrelated, and this is about student, you know, the struggles that students go through to attend college. Uh, you both made reference to uh, your, your awareness, and in some cases, you know, firsthand or secondhand experience with the challenges that students may have, with, especially if they're first generation college going students, um, if they face other barriers. Um, one of the things that has certainly made headlines in the last few years in our, in our nation is the student debt crisis. So it's become a, a national conversation about uh, the debt that students leave their higher education with um, and how that impacts the rest of their lives. Uh, and of course, in California, um, the big cost, it's not our tuition, that's relatively low. Uh, but of course, books and supplies are cost and then living and the cost of living in a coastal community is, is massive. So how do you think an institution like Santa Barbara City College, what tools do you have if you're sitting on the board of trustees um, to help support uh, students uh, through that to remove barriers. Uh, what what are the levers and tools that you believe could be brought to bear? Uh, you are sitting in that seat, and uh, Mr. Miller, I'm going to I'm going to start with you on this one. Well, uh, that, that's a tough one. Um, going to college um, is is an expensive proposition in it, it, in the year 20, 2020. I'd like to think that. Uh, going to Santa Barbara City College is a bargain. Um, and one reason it's a bargain, for our, at least for our local high school students, due to, due to the efforts of the foundation and the SBCC uh, Promise Program, students locally can go to SBCC without uh, costs for tuition, books, uh, supplies. But of course, we know that's not the only cost to, uh, to attending college. There, there's the basic cost of living, food, uh, clothing, uh, uh, medical uh, assistance. So, you know, I think w within the resources that we have, I think we do, we do an excellent job. We have a food pantry for those in most need. Uh, we have a clothing outlet for those, for those, for those in, in most need. And we have a student services that, that attempt to direct students, those, those who are most disadvantaged to those resources whether it's loans or grants or, or other services available, uh, uh, available to students. Uh, but I'd just like to, to end by commenting that uh, I read recently about a study done comparing how students uh, do who've gone to community colleges as opposed to those who've gone to private uh, trade schools to learn, to learn a trade. And what they found was interesting. They found that uh, that those who spend a lot of money and borrow a lot of money going to private, uh, uh, private schools, at uh, trade schools, as compared to community colleges, end up coming out with tremendous amounts of debt and earn less money than those who go to a community college. And the, the basic conclusion of this article was, community colleges are a tremendous resource and tremendous bargain that you cannot overlook when you're thinking about your education. Thank you. Mr. Lichty. Yes, sir. Well, college costs are tremendously expensive. I, I think um, for my family, we live, I live here in Guarita, have for a long time. And with our son, we wanted him to take advantage of the tremendous cost savings that SPCC provides, and then he could transfer. So 
he was able to live at home and we saved all kinds of money doing that. Uh, I had to uh, provide for my family as pretty much the sole income earner and it's not easy in this town, uh, regular uh, salary. So uh, community college, uh, city college really helps everyone in that kind of position uh, because it is such a, um, a bargain really to get your education, get your credits and be able to move on to uh, the UC system or even into the trade schools or into a profession. Uh, just like uh, Robert Miller identified, yes, the school already prepared or helps students quite a bit with the, the food pantry and uh, medical and even in housing assistance. So I think we'd want to continue on with those programs and maybe even expand them as, as needed. And um, I think that's important for the, the safety and the well-being and the health for, for the students. So thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, uh, before we get to your closing statements and we're gonna move to the next seat, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw in a surprise lightning round question here for each of you. So uh, it's gonna be a sim simple, short answer, but I'd like to each of you, I, I know you've either been on or been paying attention to the, the board's uh, activities over these last months and years, uh, potentially. Can you give an example of something you feel uh, the board did very well, the board of trustees, and then something that you uh, are critical of or that you would have done differently? Um, and that can be whether you're a, you were a sitting member at the time or not. Huh. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go to you, Mr. Miller, as the one with the most experience there. So apologies for that in advance. But uh, something that you're very proud of that you've seen the board do either while you were on it or not. And then something that you were, you were critical of as far as the board's actions that you would have done differently or, or wished had gone differently. Well, the resolution 18 uh, immediately comes to mind as something I think we, we did uh, uh, extremely well. We reacted uh, very quickly within a, a couple weeks. We only, we only meet one to two times a month. So I, I think we uh, reacted as, as quickly as possible. And I'm proud of that, that we were able to put together a resolution that had uh, meaning and, uh, 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 and was able to uh, gather the support of a, a, a vast majority of, of the board. Um, Can you define Resolution 18 for our viewers who may not be familiar with that? Or what well, resolution 18 was uh, a resolution passed by the board in response to the um, response to the George Floyd killing, and, and it started out by recognizing that Black Lives Matter, uh, and then went on to talk about uh, ways that we can attack uh, racism uh, on. Uh, on campus, and that's seven, the seven action items I, I mentioned earlier. Okay. As to, um, as to actions that I'm critical of, that, that, that's a, that, that is a, uh, that, that's a tougher, uh, that, that's a tougher one to, uh, to respond to. I, I can't immediately think of, of actions that we've taken that were, we're wrong, you know. I think in most cases the board the board acts, if not with uh, unanimity, but with a, a strong majority. So um, uh, I, I'm right. at the moment for <laughs> all right. To identify something uh, critical. I'm sure there are. I'm, it's just not coming to me. All right, uh, Mr. Lichty, uh, something that you've seen the board do that you uh, support or, or want to compliment, and something that you've seen the board take action or do or or say that you're critical of. Yes. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind that I'm really pleased that the board and I give credit to the board members uh, right away. You know, being a board member is a gift of uh, it's a gift of public service. Uh, there's not any compensation, and it's really it's really a philanthropy on their part to, to give their energy and time and attention uh, to serving the students in the community. And I really appreciated that they hired Dr. Gaswami. He seems like the right man at the right moment. I think he's uh, excellent for uh, taking us and uh, steering us through these uh, difficult times. So I think they did a great job with that. And uh, what I maybe might be critical of, uh, nothing uh, really comes to mind about that either. I mean, they, this board, if anything, they, uh, they get together and they deal with some complex problems and uh, take in a lot of information from a lot of different sources and have to digest that, synthesize it, and come up with a, a, common, a common vision. And I think they've done that well. So I'm not going to give any criticism to the board this time. Thank you. OK. 
Okay. A, a criticism free moment. That's a, we can all remember this. Remember this. So I want to move now uh, quickly into closing statements from you both. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but uh, I'm glad you, you both were able to join us and speak a bit about your philosophy on budget, on equity, diversity, and of course, uh, on student finance. Uh, can you offer a few closing thoughts? Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Miller. Well, as I said in my opening, we face serious challenges, both financial and operational, and those challenges will not soon disappear. We expect non-resident enrollment to increase in the coming years, but we can't count on a restoration of pre-COVID-19 levels. One of the reasons we are in this situation is the state's budget went from a multi-million dollar surplus to a $54 million deficit almost overnight. And we can no longer count on Washington to enact local and state relief anytime soon. I'd also note that nationally, the number, the number of virus cases are going up, not down, while vaccine trials have been suspended. We have to accept these realities as we seek a balanced budget in two years. Doc, Dr. Goswami acknowledges it can't occur without some pain. With 90% of our budget devoted to personnel and our operational costs already trimmed, we have limited options. Greater efficiencies such as larger class sizes and our operating cuts will occur, but those kinds of cuts alone will not be enough. Regardless of these obstacles, Dr. Goswami has presented a sound strategy and I'm confident we will succeed. We will emerge from this crisis as a stronger and better institution. We must because too many students count on us. Now more than ever, a good education is essential, especially for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Before I end, I wanna take the opportunity to thank the foundation for their generous help to so many students. When the shutdown occurred in March, the foundation immediately stepped up to the plate and devoted more than $2 million in grants for 2,300 students in need. I'm still stunned with how rapidly and efficiently they responded to the need. We may never know exactly how many students' futures were saved. I am proud that the college picked up where the foundation left off using grants from the CARES Act to help students with money, laptops, and hotspots. We are part of a generous and caring community at SBCC, and I'm proud to be part of it. It has been a great privilege to serve on the board, and I ask for your vote so that I might continue to serve the community and our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. And final words, you get the last word, uh, Mr. Lichty. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, I want to also thank uh, the foundation. Uh, I saw your presentation uh, recently to the board, and I really appreciated what the foundation has done uh, this last year, just like Mr. Miller told us. I liked a couple of data points, though. I like that the foundation uses only 10% uh, of administration overhead as part of their, of their budget. And I, and I like the other data point where there's a 40 to 1 investment ratio uh, for uh, the amount of uh, giveaways and, and, and charity that the foundation provides for students for an investment of $200,000 can return $8 million in student need help. And so I would support that annual stipend or to help the, the Santa Barbara op Foundation's operations coming from the college. Now, uh, to be a, a candidate, the ideal candidate uh, for a community college is somebody that's committed to the values of public education, and that's me, um, that with someone that reflects an attitude of public service. I've already demonstrated that with my life and career. Um, someone that desires to improve the community the, that in which they live, and I am that. They have an open mind. I'm always open to, to being persuaded. I, I will let facts change my my perspective and opinion uh, if they, when they come to bear, and, and um, I have an opportunity uh, look outlook on the future. And uh, number one is, and I came to realize this young, uh, as a young philosopher, is that I love learning. And SBCC is a learning um, institution, and I want to support that. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you both so much, uh, Mr. Ron Lichty and Mr. Robert Miller, uh, candidates for Area 2. Uh, Robert currently serves as an incumbent. Ron is a challenger and uh, the election is November 3rd and you all know that. So I really want to appreciate both of you gentlemen for your time and we're going to move on to our next seat. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right, folks, um, we're going to go ahead and move on to area number three. And the candidates for this uh, are also, we have one incumbent and one challenger. Our incumbent is uh, Veronica Gallardo, and our challenger is Aaron Garenia. And uh, we are going to run through the same series of, uh, of a brief but a spectacular conversation uh. some of our big issues. So if we can get uh, Aaron on the screen. We will get started. Um, I will again take a moment here to remind everyone uh, that you can uh, take a, another look at this. It is being recorded. We will post it on our website when the uh, when the time comes. And uh, of course, um, we uh, really encourage everyone to make sure you are registered to vote. The last day is Monday to do so and make certain. And then, of course, vote by November 3rd. Welcome. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I said, uh, Veronica Garrido, incumbent uh, for Area 3, Aaron Garenia, challenger candidate for Area 3, and uh, we're going to start off with some opening statements once again, uh, and we'll start with you, uh, Veronica. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the Foundation for hosting this. Hello, Santa Barbara and everyone out there. Um, so, Jeff, I have a deep connection to Santa Barbara City College that spans over 20 years. I will tell you that I first learned at Santa Barbara City College because I am the third of seven children. And so my older brother and sister were already at UCSB. And I had a really great uh, college counselor that said to me one day, you know, Ronnie, if you don't go to college, you're never going to move out of the house. Of course, being 17 years old, you're not thinking of your future. You're thinking, well, I have a job. I have a couple cents in my bank account. Who's thinking college? So anyway, being a teenager and third of, of seven kids, being in the middle, I was like, I need to get out. So I quickly did my research and I found Santa Barbara City College. Um, I literally moved here one Saturday morning. I told my dad, dad, I think I wanna go to Santa Barbara. And he said, all right, I'll get the oil checked on the car. And I stepped into student services and I met Miss Cindy Salazar, who my family and my parents will forever be grateful for. And I said, hi, my name is Veronica um, Garcia at the time. I said, I just moved here from the Bay Area and I want to go to college. And she said, did you fill out the FAFSA? No. Did you apply? Uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, do you have your tax information? No. And so she kind of just rolled her eyes a little bit, took me across the street. I met Liliana Cuellar, who was the financial aid advisor at the time. They hooked me up with Marsha Wright. In a matter of not even four hours, I had um, a job. Cindy's hired me as a student worker. Um, I had classes. I'd met um, a wonderful team of counselors. I didn't qualify for EOPS, and that's because, Jeff, I've worked every day of my life since I was 15 years old. Being a family of seven, you kind of have to figure it out and get things going. Um, and so I kind of had that threshold of, like, I didn't make enough money to like, you know, pay for my classes, but I make too much to qualify for financial aid through EOPS or that stuff. And that's where I met the Santa Barbara City College Foundation. I don't know if you guys still have it, but at the time, Jeff, you guys had a program or we had a program. It was adopt a student and a donor adopted me. And it was not a lot of money, but between my part-time work at the college and then later working downtown in cosmetics, um, a donor gave me 200 bucks a semester and I would meet with her quarterly and we'd have lunch. And that to me, I was like, wow, someone, a stranger gave me money. I remember that forever. Um, fast forward, you know, years later, I now teach locally here in Santa Barbara. I'm a teacher. I taught first grade in kindergarten. Um, when I was working in, in college, I met a woman downtown and she's like, hey, can you help us do an event? And so she was part of the junior league. I'm like, well, what do you guys do? She's like, well, we raise money and we train women and we dedicate to, you know, improving the lives of women and children. I was like, oh, cool. Um, and so I, I went to my first, like, I guess you can say, uh, philanthropy event. And there I was as a young college student, and we were part of Bays of the Bowl, where the Junior League was helping renovate the bowl. And so when I moved back to Santa Barbara, and I was a part-time student advisor at the college, the college was going through all these budget cuts. And I remember we were not going to be able to do the ceremony for the TAP kids. And I thought, well, I there's this group, the Junior League, and maybe I should join them. And I feel like if I can train myself and learn some stuff. And so the college was like, yeah, go Beto. So anyway, we ended up um, raising money. I ended up like going and getting gift cards from everywhere I could find. We chopped up the food and we cooked it all in my kitchen and we served it. And we served, we had this amazing uh, ceremony for the Transfer Achievement Program. Um, 
since then, you know, I got asked about eight years ago, Vero, run for the board. I thought, well, why would I ever do that? And they're like, because you know the college, you love kids, you love families. Um, so anyway, I did. I ran for the board. We had a time warning. We're at about three and a half minutes. So Okay. I'll and so um, here I am. I've just dedicated my time to serving families and volunteering at local organizations. So it's what we do around here. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, same for you, uh, Ms. Erin Grania, you have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff Green. Um, thank you to Santa Barbara City College, and thank you to all the people of Santa Barbara for having me here today. Uh, my name is Erin Guarena. I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Barbara. I'm a skilled barber, and I'm a small business owner here in town. Um, and I'm running for Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees because, like many people, I'm ready for change on our community college campus. A recent campus climate survey showed that there's no trust between senior leadership and Santa Barbara City College employees. Even worse, the survey showed that there's no confidence that the college can effectively handle acts of discrimination. In these difficult times, we have trustees who can't even agree that Black Lives Matter. The survey is proof that the board is failing the college's mission to foster an equitable and inclusive community dedicated to student success. We need culturally competent board leadership that represents our community's values of anti-racism. It's one of many reasons I am proud to, be, to have the endorsement of the Santa Barbara City College chapter of California School Employees Association so that we can work together to restore the trust and safety reopen Santa Barbara City College. I grew up on the east side just like my parents. I know that Santa Barbara City College is an invaluable resource for immigrants and the children of immigrants like myself. Our community college fosters dual enrollment with high schools. It welcomes newly graduated seniors with free education and it provides affordable resources to anyone in our community pursuing life advancements, whether they be academic, vocational, or a new life skill. The college has amazing programs and a world-class campus, but there's more that we could be doing to enhance the lives of the residents of Santa Barbara. As a skilled tradesperson and entrepreneur, I know that Santa Barbara City College can be the part of the economic recovery from COVID-19. Thousands of people in our community are out of work, and Santa Barbara City College can provide the necessary affordable job training programs that will help them get back on their feet and stay healthy during the pandemic. We need board members who are not afraid to reinvest in our campus to keep more local dollars in our community and help us fill budget deficits without sacrificing jobs during a public health crisis. I am proudly endorsed by the Santa Barbara Democratic Party, the Santa Barbara Young Democrats, Congressman Salud Carbajal, uh, the Planned Parenthood, the Central Coast Planned Parenthood Action Fund, the Central Coast Labor Council, the Women's Political Committee, Mayor Kathy Murillo, Council Member Oscar Gutierrez, Santa Barbara City Council Member, I'm sorry, Board of Trustees member uh, Jonathan Abood, uh, and you know I'm I'm here. I live in Santa Barbara, and if you live in Santa Barbara City, sorry, if you live in the area three for Santa Barbara City College, uh, which is the downtown area, uh, east side and west side, I humbly ask for your vote. Starting next, starting this week, uh, please vote for Aaron Wedenya, the only Democrat and the only barber on the ballot. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so we've covered already in some of these statements a lot of ground, but I, I'm going to hit on at least three big issues right now for, for the college and give you each an opportunity to speak to them. Uh, and it's no secret that Santa Barbara City College has had some budget challenges as many public institutions live through budget cycles, uh, some on the upswing, some on the down. And right now we've got a situation where as of most, the most recent assessment, we're looking at a, just shy of a $5 million, $4.9 million projected deficit. Um, that number is vacillated between a couple million dollars and over 10 uh, as different factors are weighed in of what the state can do, what the federal government can do. And of course, there's all the questions around enrollment revenues, uh, not to mention expenses and programs. So my, my question to you both is, would you share with us a bit um, as one of your primary responsibilities on, on the board of trustees is managing the overall budget of the college? What is your philosophy and how would you think through the hard choices that you have to make uh, in the context of your job, the fact that it's a shared governance system, uh, and the complexity of, of the institution as a whole. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you first, uh, Veronica, as, as the incumbent on the board, uh, and take uh, up to two minutes to just give us a sense of how you think through this work. Thank you, Jeff. So we are all aware of the volatility with the public education funding, and of course, we're lumped in with K-12, right? So we look at this K-14, Prop 98 guarantee, which is basically that state with language jargon, it basically tells us how we're funded. Um, so we understand the politics behind how we're funding and whatnot. Having said that, 
I think the important thing to consider, Jeff, is whenever as a board member, and you certainly did that when you presented last week to us at the board, you're presented with, you know, some strategies or some different ways to um, mitigate what's going on here. As a board member, I think we always want to ask two or three cost equivalent alternatives, right? So if someone's going to say, hey, we want to look at cutting this, or we want to look at retooling this, we want to always ask, well, which one's going to do the most for students, right? And so I think that that's one thing that I've always valued in terms of when we're looking at cutting, because we're going to have to cut. We're looking at cutting about $3.5 million in the next two years. One thing to note is the college has traditionally had strong financial stewardship. So we have, as you know, close to $70 million in cash flow. So the college is not going to not make payroll anytime soon. So that's the good news, right? However, with the governor giving us those deferrals, it was basically like an IOU. So we kind of have to figure out how to retool our budget. We have money to cover this, but we have to make sure that it's going to make the most for students. Another thing that we're going to have to look at is putting some trade-offs on the table. Jeff, you did that with your staff. You guys looked at benefits, right? You retooled some things. This is a time in California where we have to look at everything. California has some very generous OPEB benefits, right? other post-employee benefits. We have health care. So putting everything on the table is what we're going to have to do if we're going to reduce that 90% of our salaries and benefits as a percentage to our total budget. Um, so I hope that helps. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so Aaron, same question to you. How do you uh, think through a, a budget uh, of this, this sort of size and complexity and, and make those hard choices? And what, what goes into your considerations when you're in that position? You know, we, we really have to look at our students like customers, um, and we need to evaluate the campus and what we're not providing to our customers. Um, where are they going to get their needs, you know, if, if it's other community colleges or private institutions, and how we can both improve our programs as well as uh, bringing new programs that we might be able to benefit the, the students here in, in our community, um, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's really critical in this day and age that we really take a look at career education. Um, so many people are losing their jobs and so many people are indebted to, to student debt costs um, that it's, you know, why are our, our students going into such debt and how can we improve their lives? Um, and, it, you know, I, I think that career education is you know, one thing that we really could be looking at um, because, you know, you, the programs are shorter, you get to the money quicker. Um, and, you know, there's, there's programs that we don't have that service communities like the one I'm trying to represent, Area 3, um, especially like in the skilled trades, uh, you know, how many of our students are going other places to get that and you know, more students on campus does equal more dollars. Also, you know, on our current ballot, there's Proposition 15 that would, uh, you know, have the potential to bring upwards of six million dollars to our campus, which would, you know, equal up that gap in uh, in our deficit right now. As a small business owner and a leaseholder here in Santa Barbara, I hold a triple net lease, um, so it is not to my advantage to want to support that because I, I pay the property taxes on my commercial space. Um, and if, if you're not aware of what Proposition 15 is, it, it increases um, the property taxes on commercial and industrial spaces over a certain amount. My, my business would qualify for that. But you know, it's critical that we support schools. Um, that money would be going to K through 14 and it would impact our, our campus directly. So. You know, those are two ways that we could be addressing the deficits that we're seeing on campus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so I want to I want to pivot now to uh, another big topic. We, I mean, obviously, money is a big piece of it. Um, but in this moment, in particular, issues of equity, diversity, access. Um, this is something that is a, a long-standing conversation, obviously, in in all kinds of institutions and in our country. Uh, but in re recent years, recent months, especially uh, post uh, the murder of George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movements and associated movements, uh, there's a renewed focus on this in our, in our community, in our country, and in our institutions. 
And I, I'm going to take uh, as given that we all would agree that uh, equity is a good thing, that we want to remove barriers, we want to welcome students. So I, I don't so much want to hear a debate on that piece of it, uh, but more about the broader range of positions that people take. So on one end of the spectrum, you have folks that simply say, yes, I believe in equity, um, but may not believe that there is such a thing as, say, structural racism. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have people talking in institutional, historical, and structural terms. So a two-part question for you, where do you fall in that? And what is your analysis of the problem? Uh, and I, I recognize this could be a seven-day question. I said it to the last set of candidates. So I'm, I know I'm asking you to combine a lot into two minutes. Um, so where you stand, your perspective, and then secondarily, what the, what the institution's role is in grappling or addressing with those issues. How do you, how do you see the role of SBCC, and particularly where you would sit on the trustee board um, as what is, what is the thing or things you can do um, to make progress in those, in those issues. Um, I'm going to start with you, Erin, on, on this question. Thank you, Jeff. That's a, you know, really interesting question. So far, you know, in the, in the last few years, there's been two resolutions that have addressed equity on campus, Resolution 10 and Resolution 18, and both times my opponent, Veronica Gallardo, voted against them. Um, you know, on Resolution 10, uh, one statement I, that was made uh, in opposition of it was, you know, if we address it, if we acknowledge that there is a problem, how would it um, open us up to lawsuits? But, you know, I think that we shouldn't be focusing on how we could get in trouble. We should be focusing on why we might be getting in trouble. And, you know, there's bigger issues on campus and, you know, it's a beautiful campus, it's amazing facilities, amazing programs, but if, if students don't feel safe, then we don't have a successful campus. Um, you know, and we might not feel like in our community and our safe little bubble of Santa Barbara that there are issues, um, but you know, one thing that people might not be aware of is that you know, there was a black student that had the police call on them to the library because someone that worked in the library didn't acknowledge them as a student um, you know, there's thousands of students on campus. How is someone working in the library supposed to know what, who every student is? We, we should have, you know, Resolution 18 especially would address those um, issues and, and be able to, you know, provide the services to our faculty staff um, to have diversity and inclusion training as well as for there to be ways for the acts of discrimination to be safely reported. Um, and you know, it, it's just, I think that we have to really look at the safety of our students to have a, a successful campus. Um, so I think it's, it's crucially important that we have board members that support equity on campus. Um, you know, unfortunately with resolution 18, my opponent voted against it even when compromises were given. Uh, and I, I do know that the other board members that did vote for it, um, especially the, the two that wrote it, Marsha Croninger and Jonathan Booth, don't always see eye to eye on everything, but they worked so that, you know, they could present a united front in, uh, you know, the wake of the death of George Floyd. You know, we as a campus need to show that we support our students of all colors, um, but, you know, we need to support our black students because it would be ridiculous for us not to acknowledge that there is you know, structural racism, um, you know, inherent racism, you know, it, it, it plays out in every aspect of life and we need a campus that is safe and secure. Um, and I think that that's why there needs to be a change uh, for representation for area three, you know, which is historically uh, the black neighborhood of Santa Barbara was the east side. And, you know, it's, it's a heavily populated Latino neighborhood. So, you know, though equity is especially important for those communities. Okay, thank you. Um, Veronica, a two-part question. So your, your perspective on, on how you see issues of equity and, and structural racism and, or anywhere in between, and then how, how you see the institution, what's the, its role in addressing those things? Thank you, Jeff. And so for someone that spent over 20 years in both K-12, higher ed, City College specifically, this is something I think about daily um, in the classroom. The biggest barrier to student success is the lack of adequate literacy. And so if we're going to move our students, Jeff, as you know, onto a trajectory of having 
a college going mindset or even having the ability to be able to enroll in a dual enrollment course right after eighth grade, you're going to have to have the literacy skills to be able to think, read and write at an academic level to succeed in college level course. So first off, I think the college has a commitment and, and a role to play with our K-12 partnership. So that's one thing. And that's a larger, you know, K-14 issues that we can talk, you know, a lot about. Um, secondly, you know, with regard to having all of our community partners work together, the health and safety and the public well-being of our college students, of our neighboring K-12 uh, students is incredibly important. Jeff, the challenges that the college faces, we're going to need the enthusiasm of the entire community to come around us and say, we get behind Santa Barbara City College because it is a gem in our community that it has the potential to lift families out of poverty to provide the financial independence that we need. And everybody's a part of that. Law enforcement, teachers, parents, grandparents, neighbors. Um, with regards to just some of these bigger issues that we see in our nation and you know in our society, California, let's just narrow the scope here to the micro world of Santa Barbara City College staff. And so there's a proverb and it says, cast out the scoffer and contention will leap. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. And I can say this to you publicly because we talked about this publicly at our board retreat with Dr. Benjamin. In 2018, when I chaired the board with Dr. Beebe, we had a member of our board that compromised um, confidentiality with our president. Emails were leaked. Um, a lot of uh, actions were taken that were not good for the college. So a lot of these things that were created at the college were directly stemmed from the board. And so if the board would have acted like a responsible collective governing body that was there to protect the institution from undue influence, we would have gotten behind our number one employee. Now, since then, Dr. Beebe has since retired and has taken care of his health and, you know, God bless him and he's doing well. However, the responsibility to lead with integrity and with character and with trust lies on a trustee. And that means you're going to lead for the entire community. Jeff, I can tell you, you know, when we had the Montecito mudslides and all the things that were happening, I work in a public school. My kids attend public education. And so we had things going on that in the name of equity are, are not okay. You can't say we're gonna do this for one group and not for the other. We're Santa Barbara, and I've said it before, and I think you agree, if we're gonna lift families out of poverty, if people are gonna accomplish the goals and careers and that, that are in their heart and that they were called to, then we're gonna have to come together for everyone. And I think Santa Barbara City College Foundation is like the epitome of that. The Promise is a local program for all kids. And that I think is what has been so successful about it, that families know that it's for their kid. It doesn't matter where you come from, how much parents your money your parents have, or what your educational trajectory was, we're here and we're going to help you. So I just think that when we're thinking of these issues of equity and of access, Jeff, it's going to look at all of our programs, our K-12 partners, where this starts. It's going to look at Santa Barbara City College. And we're going to say, what's the best thing for students? I think you've heard Dr. Goswami say. We're, we're over three minutes. I'm going to give you the All same. Right. All right. So that's the same. So he says up to us. Dr. Goswami says, if you see something, did you do anything about it? And I think that that's where we all have to come together. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. Uh, I, we have room for one more question before I'm going to have a couple of quickies and then a, a closing statement for you tonight. I want to move to the issue of student finance and student uh, fiscal challenges. You both uh, referenced this in your prior remarks. Uh, in this last couple of years, it's become a national conversation, uh, and we've talked everything about proposals to, for free college to student debt now uh, approaching $2 trillion in the United States. So we've got some big issues there. Um, what do you see as the role of a trustee and in, in the institution in, in particular uh, in helping students to navigate that to overcoming financial barriers what what could the uh, the, the institution do beyond what it already does um, and or are there certain programs that you believe are are the most effective at helping students uh, navigate um, we'll start with you uh, Veronica Thank you, Jeff. So as you know, I've been a huge proponent of dual enrollment. Not only does it reduce the time that a student will take to graduate from college, but you're saving money. If you go from 
a California Community College to a UC, a lot of those courses transfer. We have an amazing articulation agreement with a lot of CSUs, UCs, and even private schools. So I think that our dual enrollment program is definitely going to play a role in reducing the time that students uh, take to graduate. Um, additionally, it's going to be a strong counseling guidance. Santa Barbara City College was part of that pilot, as you know, with Guided Pathways. And so really looking at what is it that your career track is going to be and what is the most effective way to get you there so that you're taking the courses. And sure, you can take enrichment and other sprinkled around there, but what are the courses that you need that are going to lead you to towards your goal? But also tied to that, Jeff, Focusing on our school of extended learning and increasing the trajectory of parents in the home, you're increasing income and salaries in that home, right? So when you increase salaries and income in a home, you're increasing the language, the literacy, the lexicon of a child. So then they're already have a better chance entering kindergarten. So really, I think it goes from our school of extended learning, dual enrollment, and everything in between to say, how is it that we're providing a way for families to uh, step into that upward mobility and how are we positioning our institution so that we can be fiscally responsible so that when we do go to the foundation, they say, well, what's going on with Santa Barbara City College's financials? Oh, no, they got their house in order. Because a lot of what I see, Jeff, is I see foundations all around this city supplanting what they should be supplementing. And for as much money as the philanthropic nonprofit community pours into our K-14 schools, we should be the gem of all of California and if not the United States. And so really my heart and my hope is that we would sort of like align all of those things so that when our philanthropic partners come in and as my family has, because you have a commitment to the college, you see your kid doing well at college, you say, yes, I want to give, not because it hurts, but because it feels good. And so that's what I would love to see is our partners coming together to see a K-14 system that works so that they can come in and supplement for our students. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Uh, Ms. Garrett, yeah, what would you say uh, to the challenges of student uh, fiscal health and debt and all the things that uh, the students have to overcome? How could the institution do, do better, do more? Or what does it do well with respect to helping students navigate that? You know, having grown up on the east side, which is in area three, I went to Franklin, which services the east side. My parents both were state workers, uh, you know, very middle class, and I was considered the rich kid. Um, you know, the last two candidates both said multiple times that City College is a bargain, but, you know, if a middle class income family, you know, is the rich family, how are the other students struggling? And, you know, we have this amazing program with the Promise that affords the, you know, free education for two years, but some of these students still can't access it because they don't have the resources to, to step aside from working full time, uh, you know, because they have to help support their families. So, you know, maybe there is more that we could be doing to, um, you know, I don't know, in some way working together with the foundation to maybe make it more of like a unit based um, program as opposed to a time based program, you know, making some kind of compromise. For, for students or like a waiver for some students that, you know, they want the accessibility of these programs to have the upward mobility, but they really still can't access it. Um, another thing that, you know, we really need to focus on is housing. 19% of California community college students face housing insecurity. Uh, a lot of times I've heard like, well, you know, they can just live with their parents, but that isn't always the, the means. Like, you would, you would think that, oh yes, you know, there's always the parents to rely on, but a lot of students don't have that. And also only 40% of, of, of the students on campus are between the ages of 17 and 19. You know, that means that 60% of the campus are adults. Like, you know, they could be out on their own. Um, so, you know, for student success and for, you know, helping them financially, we really need to look at the way that we handle housing. A lot of other, not a lot, but you know, there are more and more other community colleges are looking at housing. Um, and it's, it's critical, especially because it, it doesn't just impact the students on campus, it impacts the families around campus who are consistently getting pushed out of these uh, more affordable areas so that landlords can rent to, you know, students from out of state or international who might be able to afford, you know, more than what these families are currently paying. So, 
you know, th there's like a lot that we can be looking at. There's, there's already amazing programs. There's, you know, the state programs um, like BOG but, and, and the Promise. But I think that there's a lot more we could be addressing. Okay. Thank you. Um, so before we go into closing statements for you both, I, I do want to do a quick lightning round. Uh, if you observed our last candidates, I'm going to ask you a, a similar question. Um, and that is, uh, you know, in, in one case, you're, you sat on the board for, for two terms. In the other case, you, I'm sure you watched and participated in board meetings. Um, if you think back on the board's performance uh, and the times that you've, you've witnessed it or been part of it, what's something that you're really proud of or supportive of or you've seen done very well? And what's something that you are critical of or you wish were done differently or you would, you would undo if you were in that seat? So a compliment to the board's work, a criticism of the board's work, and we're going to try to do this in 30 seconds if we can. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Veronica. Thank you, Jeff. So getting behind the School of Extended Learning, I think, was just a wonderful thing that the board did. And I, I have a story. I dropped off my daughter, who's now a senior. She was 14 at the time at Santa Barbara City College for an evening dual enrollment course. And as I was leaving, it was fall like this, so the sun was setting. And as you know, it was at night already, so it was dark. And I hear the laughter of children. And I'm like, what? what's going on? And I, I'm up there in the East Campus outside of Student Services. And I turn around, and it's this mother. And she's kissing her daughter goodbye. And dad is there waiting with the child. And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, that's it. That's Santa Barbara City College. That mom is on her way to get her ESL class. That dad, they just wrapped up dinner. Little kid is like running around the City College parking lot and dad is waiting for them. And that Jeff is like the resiliency of the Hispanic Latino community that I have seen that I am so proud of their hard work, their tenacity. And because I teach, I've been invited into these homes zooming every single day and if you saw what i saw jeff you would get up every day and do a cartwheel even on the hardest day all right so i heard a, i heard a compliment is there is there a board criticism is there anything on the uh, board agenda you wish you'd done differently or someone else had done differently or had gone differently you know i think i addressed that already jeff and we talked about it at our board retreat um, unfortunately that tape is all gone it somehow didn't get print uh, recorded but um, I think the board, you know, could have acted as a whole more to support our superintendent president. And I think the events of 2018 would have unfolded a little different. I think it hurt a lot of people and it hurt our community, um, but there's grace. And so we all moved on. And so there's definitely a commitment from the board to act with integrity, with trust, transparency, and with the character that embodies the spirit and the lifestyle of Ocala Burn Community College Mission. Okay, thank you. Um, Aaron, what's something you've seen the board do that you want to compliment and what's something that you would critique? I want to compliment the board on passing resolution 18 and address, addressing racial equity. Um, I'd like to read the first sentence of it and it's uh, Santa Barbara City College is committed to fostering an equitable, inclusive, respectful, participatory and supportive educational community dedicated to the success of every student. Um, you know, it's now more important than ever that we support measures like this and resolutions like this on campus so that we have success with students. Um, but that is why I'm running. You know, I am an industry that has been directly impacted by COVID. I've been out of work uh, on and off for the last six, seven months. Um, I should be focusing on my career and, you know, rebuilding what has been lost. But I saw a need on the board in my area because my opponent doesn't support equity on campus. I mean, if it's about officers of the law, yes, we all support officers of the law, but I've talked to police officers, I've talked to sheriffs, and they also have addressed that things need to change, you know? And if it was just about the police, then why didn't Veronica attend the the summit on racism. She was the only board member that didn't attend. You know, we, we can't, we have to have a united front on this one thing, you know, to ensure the success of students, which is just fundamentally important for the success of campus. Okay, so I heard the compliment on the, on the, on the resolution 18. Is there a, a specific critique of how you've seen the board work or act that you'd like to share? Well, that's how, I, I, I'm sorry, that's uh, my critique on my opponent was, you know, I, I really feel that the board, you know, on this one thing really need, they really need to have a united front. Um, All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so it is, I do wanna give you both a chance to, to have a final word. 
Uh, and so we're going to do it in the same order where we did opening statements. Uh, so uh, Veronica, any, any closing statements that you'd like to share with folks about your candidacy or, or anything at all? Two minutes. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so I, you know, dedicated my time to serving children and families in this community for over 20 years. It's been a true joy. And I always tell folks this type of work, it's a calling, Jeff. It's not a career choice. You don't choose to become a teacher. You don't choose to wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to be a board member and spend 12 hour days and take my own personal time and money to attend conferences for the board. It's something that you believe in. Your family has to get behind it. And I couldn't be more proud, Jeff. I truly envision, you know, people talk about goals and we have goals daily. But I have vision and I truly envision that Santa Barbara City College can support students in our entire community to be financially independent, to, you know, reach the upward mobility that we need, uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, attain certificates and degrees, whatever we need. Um, I had a couple of weeks ago, Jeff, a student, I'll leave you with this and just to sh tell you that I am, I'm a glass half full person. I, I believe in our community. Years ago, you know, when we first moved back to Santa Barbara after Juan was in grad school over 20 years ago, I had grandmothers here in my living room. I was helping kids fill out their applications for City College. And Juan came home the other night and he's like, hey, I saw so-and-so. He's like, guess what? He got married, like graduated from Cal Poly and he's having a baby. And I'm like, what? The kid that was like in our living room with grandma? And so that to me, Jeff, that's my heart. I was at Lazy Acres last night. I ran into the guy with the groceries. I'm like, how's your son? I'm like, all right, I'll text you. I, we, we're offering tutoring online, don't worry. It's just what I do. It, th for me, this is a work that is an extension of me. It's part, it's what I do for my neighbors, for anyone I see at the grocery store. And certainly for the families I work with at Franklin, at McKinley, and now at Roosevelt. Um, and I think that there's a lot of hope to be had right now. I think our community is lucky to have Santa Barbara City College. We're lucky to have you and the board. Um, and I'll tell you that my students were making observations the other day because we're observing the, mood, the weather, you know, we're meteorologists. And I said, oh, honey, but did you observe the sun? Because it was overcast. And they said, Ms. Gallardo, the sun's always shining above the clouds. And I was like, that's right. And so for me, if everyone can hear and see the, the mind and the hopes of a child like I get to, then I think that when we look at some of the things that we see in our community, what can't we solve, Jeff? We can solve anything and we can do anything. And so I look forward to uh, serving another four years. Um, my children will be in college by then, both of them, and they were like in second grade when I started this. Um, but it's a true honor and it's a calling and should the Lord open this door for me, I'm happy to step in and serve in this capacity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, minutes for final statements, Any, anything you want to cover. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm a, a business owner here in town that has successfully navigated the perils of COVID-19 with my business, uh, with reopening, and I feel like I can bring that insight to the campus as well. Uh, you know, we're going to have to address how we reopen uh, in the wake of COVID-19, and, you know, it's a slow and steady pace. We all want to be back to normal, but... We have to work with state, county officials to make sure that it, it's safe um, and that we're not incurring high costs of opening and closing. I want to help uh, address the housing insecurity in, uh, with our students on, in Santa Barbara. And I want to um, successfully support students, faculty, and staff with discrimination, um, work with the campus to make sure that there's mandatory diversity and inclusion training. Uh, so, you know, I I'm, I'm think it's time for a change uh, for representation for Area 3, and I hope that I can count on your vote uh, November 3rd for Erin Guadagna for Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I, I want to thank you both so much for making the time. Uh, really appreciate you with your dedication to this college, this community, uh, and of course to this race. Uh, thank you, Veronica Gallardo. Uh, current incumbent for the board for Area 3. Thank you, Erin Guerreña, challenger for Area 3. Uh, we wish you both well, and uh, please everyone vote November 3rd. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. All right, we are now going to transition to Area 4, and we're going to bring up our final two candidates for the evening. Uh, this is the open seat, so unlike Areas 2 and 3, uh, we do not have an incumbent running. We instead have an open seat uh, from the uh, retirement from the from the board at least of uh, Craig Nielsen for area four and uh, in the running for that seat we have two candidates we have Anna Everett and we have Celeste Barber both of whom 
uh, have deep commitments and history to education and in our community. Uh, and we're going to spend some time with you both here today uh, to talk about some big issues. So I want to start, um, in addition to welcoming you both, by giving you an opportunity to make a three-minute opening statement, introduce yourself, speak anything you want about your candidacy, uh, and uh, let folks know who you are. So we're going to start with you, Celeste. Thank you very much. Most of you watching already know me from my years teaching at the college. So I'd like to take these few minutes to talk about why the community college matters and why all of us who contribute to this school matter mightily. I'd like to talk about a remarkable student, Daniel. This was early in my teaching career at the City College. As a teenager, Daniel had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. Following his surgery and subsequent treatments, he missed many months of high school. Consequently, his brain misfired certain signals, including the ability to write coherent sentences. I discovered this from his first day writing sample in English 100, the former remedial writing course in English. The sentences he crafted in his mind appeared in writing as garbled words without any sense of sentence structure or ordering, just words randomly strewn across a page. A page. I, of course, asked him to meet with me. After he related his medical history, I told him that most likely he would have to take English 100 again in the spring. And I reassured him that it was okay, that the course was designed uh, to be taken a second time for those who needed the extra help. But Daniel would have none of it. He told me that he intended to uh, complete the course in fall semester, and then in spring semester to take English 110. And then the following year, he'd be up at Berkeley at Cal. He was pretty adamant too. So we made this deal, the two of us. Every time he turned in a draft, I promised to hand it back to him the next class period. If he was willing, so was I. Back and forth, three times a week for the good part of the full semester. And for most of those weeks, it really looked helpless, at least from my end. Still, he remained determined and together we slugged along. But then several weeks before the portfolios were due, Daniel's essays became legible, fluid and thoughtful. And somehow through sheer grit, that young man rewired the nerves in his brain. He passed English 100 handily. And then he took English 110 with me in the spring. And he was among the top 20% of students in that class. By September, he was up at Berkeley. I imagine every instructor, counselor, tutor, and librarian has similar stories to tell about their own special Daniel. Stories about students who overcame incredible adversity in order to realize their dreams. This college is exemplary in student retention and graduation rates because SBCC understands that it's up to the college to be ready for our students, to meet their needs, not the other way, and to support success from the classroom up into the pol policies that are instituted by the Board of Trustees. I'm ready to take that next step to serve on the college's governing board. I would be honored to be given your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Celeste. Uh, now on to you, Anna Everett. Uh, three minutes for an opening statement and introduction. Thank you. Hello, Jeff, and hello, everyone. Yes, I am Anna Everett, and I'm running for the Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees Area 4 seat. And I'm running because I embody City College's mission of providing quality and affordable public higher education and lifelong learning opportunities for everyone. I'm a first generation college student and my community college background helped me to close the opportunity gap that I know so many students are struggling with today. I see myself as a role model for many of the underserved students here at City College. And with my background being similar to theirs, I really think that they can relate to my experiences. The same for students from majority populations as well. Also, with my own higher education training and university administration background, I'm committed to maintaining and enhancing City College's role as a national community college leader and a treasured Santa Barbara community institution. And many of you know me from my work as a former chair and current commissioner with the Santa Barbara County Commission for Women. And I also serve on boards with the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee and the Democratic Women of Santa Barbara. I love my community volunteer work and service. 
And I also want you to know that I am a emeritus professor from UCSB and have been worked there for 22 years. I am excited about this new phase. While I was there though, I did serve as the department chair, a center director, and the interim associate vice chancellor for diversity and equity. But above all, I have a deep commitment to student learning and success. I support Black Lives Matter, women's equality and choice, LGBTQ plus and gender non-conforming identity affiliations. I support religious freedom, freedom of speech and, and expression. I support DACA and equal opportunity for all underserved groups. And let me also add that I appreciate the transfer students that I encountered when I was teaching full-time at UCSB. I found them to be well-prepared and eager to learn more. Also, City College has been a great space for our graduate students to get professional career experience. So I feel very, very connected to City College. I recognize the special challenges that COVID pandemic is posing for City College right now and all the stakeholders. I also know that the budget shortfalls are really serious, but I also know that it makes the Board of Trustees work right now all the more consequential. And that's why I'm proud to be endorsed by many city leaders and respected community organizations. So again, Jeff, thank you and the foundation for giving me this opportunity to be heard by area four voters. I hope to earn your support and I think together we can benefit the entire community. So I look forward to the conversation. And for you to see more about my endorsements and to learn more about my story, please go to my website, Everett, the number four, sbcc.com. Thank you and stay safe, everybody. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Um, and thank you both so much for, for being here. You both have deep history and knowledge of, of higher education, of the classroom, uh, the administrative side. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you both here. I want to specifically now jump to one of the big issues. Obviously, a board of trustees is responsible for, for several big pieces of the work, but one of those is, of course, budgets. Uh, public institutions have budget challenges. You both know that from experience. We all know it. Uh, and so as you sit uh, as a member of the board of, of trustees, how do you think through the various issues that go into balancing a budget. As of today, uh, the most recent report is we're looking at about a $4.9 million deficit for SBCC for this coming year. Uh, now that is vacillated between just a couple of million and over 10 million, depending on when you asked. And that has everything to do with what the state has said, what the federal government has said, uh, what enrollment trends look like, what expenses look like. Uh, so there's a lot there. And of course, it's in a shared governance system. So can you each give me a sense of what your philosophy and thought process is as you look at that and try to balance uh, the budget of the institution? I'm gonna start with you, Celeste. Well, I, I taught as an adjunct instructor at City College all those years. I was one of the two thirds of the faculty that, that enabled that college to balance its budget year after year after year. Um, but now we're in a different world. Um, we're in COVID and then for a number of years, about four years prior to uh, the pandemic, we were in a budget deficit every year. One of the great things that the board did was hire Dr. Goswami and he has a good handle on it. He's met with the board of trustees. They have a plan in place within two years, the college should be solvent again. I was an English teacher. teacher. I'm not a money person uh, and I see my role on the board as we work through the budget in a slightly different way, um, more as the programs that we cannot afford to cut. And as we're coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that concerns me is the mental health, um, the emotional health of our citizens, of our students in our community and around the country as we come out of isolation. I think most, many of us already are aware of that. Depression is up in this country. Suicides are up in this country, including among youth. And the programs that I think that are gonna be vital to be retained would certainly be physical education and sports. Uh, we're gonna need that for our physical health in order to help us with our mental and emotional health. Along with that would be the cultural programs and events that this college has always offered. Uh, live theater, lectures, music programs, even if they're impromptu, um, just, you know, little simple things on West Campus by the Overlook. But these are going to be vital 
as we emerge from this forced isolation, which was necessary, but as we come together as a community, as a community of students, particularly on that campus. And so I, I see that as my role, which programs are vital and we need to maintain, even as we are downsizing as a college and grappling with the deficit. Great, thank you so much, Celeste. Uh, Anna, how about you? How do you approach uh, all of these different forces that go into making and balancing a budget of this size? Yeah, well, I mean, a budget is, is always a difficult situation, even in good times, because you have to be stewards of the of the, the, the public funds. But I do have to um, echo Celeste by saying that the the uh, the board and the president and the and the, the previous administrations and the uh, have done a great job. Of, um, of shoring up those reserves. And I think that's really important to mention. But I also served um, in a capacity of a committee member at UCSB during that last recession. For 10 years, I was on that committee. And one of the things that I learned, I learned a lot that I think could really help me to uh, work well on the board. But one of the things that I learned was that a budget is a moral document. Um, I think it shows where your values lie. So I think it's really important that the uh, that, that even in this uh, COVID economy, I want to call it, we're really looking at how we want to approach this deficit. One of the things that we can say is that it could have been worse. <laughs> so thank goodness for the for the for the reserves that are really important. But I think with this moral document, we have to be thinking about being student um, focused and driven in our. Uh, in our in our cuts and you know the the inevitable uh, downsizing that we're going to have to do in some respects, but we have to be careful. Um, number one, I think we have to listen to all the stakeholders. They have to be in on all of the decisions to uh, to make cuts and to hear the rationale behind them. I did watch the last uh, board uh, meeting on on YouTube, and I found it to be um, uh, simultaneously encouraging and um, at the same time the idea of uh, of uh, balancing the budget in two years, I think is, is a great um, goal. But I also think that sometimes you have to do some, some, uh, some deficit spending, you know, to ensure that the, that the school is able to remain at the top um, as a community college um, going forward in the future. So I think it's really important that we be aware of that. Also, I think that, um, you know, we have to look at uh, ensuring that we remain affordable. As I think Robert was saying that you know, the City College is a good deal. Um, it is uh, affordable, but I think we have to look at how we uh, go about uh, making these, these cuts because we want to preserve the school for the future while we're dealing with this crisis and, and COVID isn't making it any easier. But I do think we have to look at how COVID is offering us some, uh, uh, some ways of thinking about maybe uh, rethinking some things. So, um, I feel good about how we can, you know, think about the COVID moment that's made uh, online um, and remote learning um, a good possibility for uh, for generating income. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that maybe going forward later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I want to pivot now to another big issue, and I apologize in advance. We're packing a lot of big issues into a small amount of time, but that's that's the nature of these fora. Uh, so I want to move now to the, the broader question of equity, diversity, inclusion. Uh, now, this is something where the, the frame of my question is going to be one where I, I'm going to assume that we're all, uh, and anyone you would ask that is running for this seat, uh, believes that the college should be uh, equitable and accessible and uh, welcome students of all backgrounds. And I, I'm going to take that as a, as a given. I think I'm going to ask, however, a two-part question, which is one, how you address and approach these this whole range of issues. Um, obviously, we're in a moment where there's an intense focus on this in the, the uh, aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and affiliated movements. Um, there's an intense focus, once again, uh, in our country around racial justice in particular, structural racism. Uh, and I think on, on that spectrum, there are some folks that really do see this as, as more of an individual. They talk about equity, they talk about fairness, uh, and on the other end, uh, people that are speaking of it in terms of structural oppression, historical racism, et cetera. So I'd, I'd ask you both where, where you fall on that. How do you see the, the problem? What is, what is the it that we're grappling with? And then the second one piece of it is just a comment on how you think the college can best address these issues from your perspective. 
uh, and that can be with respect to, to program or structure or, or anything. So, so how do sort of how do you see that that range of issues, and then how do you think the, the college, and specifically from your seat as a trustee, um, what do you believe is the best way to, to move forward and make progress? Uh, and in this one, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll switch it up here. I'll take uh, your your response first, Anna, and then and then you say. Yeah. Um you know, it's, it, it's a difficult question because, because it's looking at this moment of a national, um, global and local reckoning around issues of, of, you know, systemic racism, structural racism. And I'm glad we're having that conversation because oftentimes in a place like Santa Barbara, it's difficult to admit that, uh, that these issues are real and that we, they are affecting us and our students and our practices. So I think the fact that um, the, uh, the board's uh, passing of Resolution 18, um, as well as the, uh, the, the, the campus study on equity and inclusion are really important acknowledgements that there are some, some issues here. Um, and I think what's important about that is that leadership in these areas start from the top. Um, and I am really glad that President Goswami and the board are taking on these issues because we have to make it clear that we are going to address these issues head on. In addressing the issues head on and whenever there are, uh, there's progress made or an in, in item in, in the seven um, steps in Resolution 18, let the public know so that they have faith that you are not just making proclamations but that you're going to act on them. I think it's really key. Um, I think it's also important that the, the, the study revealed, you know, some of these um, hard issues to confront, like there is racism and, and profiling and limitations for Black and Latin, Latinx students. There's gender bias and sexism that is a problem. There's also discrimination around LGBTQ plus uh, students and the issues they're confronting around access to restrooms and what have you. Um, also access with disability. I mean, so there are so many issues around equity that really have to be addressed. And I'm glad to see that um, City College is taking a lead, you know, in, um, in, in addressing those issues now. One of the things that I wanted to say is that I, I really re um, reject the, the way that people oppose um, uh, equity and inclusion to basic training and skills development. They go hand in hand. And I really feel that um, even curricular reform would be a way that the, the, the college could address some of that. We need to know what everyone has contributed to our society to make it great and, and to make it uh, you know, historically sound. And I think by knowing what everyone has contributed, you know, women and minorities, that, that um, you know, white supremacy or these, these issues of intolerance can be lessened. So, you know, as a black professor, I know what it's like to deal with, um, uh, with, with racism and um, a, a bias. So I'm really ready to roll up my sleeves and get ready to work on this because as, as an expert in diversity and inclusion, you know, I've, I've held retreats. And so I know what it takes to get people to buy in and sometimes it's a carrot and sometimes it's a stick. But um, I'm proud that, there, that City College has started this, this journey. I'm glad there's leadership to continue with it. And yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's, an, a, it's a conversation that needs to be had and I'm ready for us to just you know, go with it, get started, get to work on it. Okay, great, thank you, Anna. Um, Celeste, uh, same question to you. What, you know, what is your perspective on, on what the challenge is or are, what the challenges are, and then what's the role of the institution, specifically maybe for, as a trustee, where do you see the, the next steps? Okay, well, I am a child of the suburbs. Um, I grew up in, in the suburbs. In fact, my parents, their first home was in one of the original Levitt towns over in East Meadow, Long Island, um, and they were predominantly white. All the schools I attended from kindergarten through 12th grade, we had maybe just a handful of blacks in our schools. And I was always, even as a little girl, I was very mindful of that. And I used to empathize. I think how much, how much, what must it feel like to be, you know, standing out like that in a school with all, with a sea of white. Um, when I moved up to Santa Barbara with my little boy, when he was three years old, um, he didn't have to go to schools like that that were so segregated. Um, fortunately, my son from kindergarten through 12th grade was always in an integrated public school and we had choices. And I chose to send him to schools here in, in Santa Barbara and then we moved up to Lompoc. 
And one of the great benefits of those schools now in the 80s and the 90s is that they were diverse, that they clearly represented my boys' community, both here in Santa Barbara County and also across the state and the nation. And he is now a better man for that. Uh, George Floyd horrifically reminds us that as a nation, as a people, we still have a long, long ways to go. But I believe that the greatest double threat to minorities in this country remains poverty and educational inequity. I believe that strongly. Um, Santa Barbara City College is a nationally renowned community college. It's tops in this state. It is a gem. We have a high, high graduation rate. Our programs are exceptional for all our students. Directly across the street is McKinley School, which has abysmally low assessment scores for language arts and math. And that's also in other schools throughout the community. I would like to see the college form a greater partnership with our local schools. We're a small enough district that we can do this. Work with these, work with our students in these, um, in, in the local schools from a very early age. Let them become familiar with City College, help them to get the tools that they need so that they are college ready when they attend and we are ready for them. I think that's very, very important that we are prepared for our students, our, our community of students, our families when they graduate. And it's not that you know they're going to leave high school and think, now what am I gonna do? Oh, maybe I'll go to City College. The assumption will be, I'm going to City College. That's my next role in life. My plan in life is to go to City College and this is what I wanna become. So um, that's my answer. Thank you so much, Celeste. Um, so I, I want to turn now to uh, a related issue, actually, to both of my prior questions. Um, uh, but but it's really uh, become a bigger issue in, in recent years in our country, and that is that of student debt, uh, of economic barriers to, to college for so many students. Uh, we're now approaching, I believe, 1.7, 1.8 trillion total student debt in the country. We've had conversations about uh, free college. We've had conversations about debt forgiveness. Um, but of course, there's a lot of pieces to go into that. We, we are talking about the tuition and supplies and books and immediate hard costs, but we're also talking about the cost of living in a, in a community like ours. Um, and as we've opened up the doors to college for more and more people, um, we've also um, faced the, the fact that so many people uh, do not have the resources to, to make this work or make it work easily. So what, what is it um, from your perspective that the institution can do, um, is doing well perhaps, or new things that should be explored, uh, to help students navigate that debt. We, we know that community college is a bargain on a relative scale, but nonetheless, um, it is still a, a major cost and that cost of living piece looms large. So if you could each share a little bit about your, your perspective um, on that. And uh, we'll start with you on that one, Celeste. I myself, I'm a product of a community college. I went to uh, Pierce Community College in the early 70s down in Woodland Hills, California. And I could never have managed um, getting a, a degree without having that community college there for me. So I, I'm a great fan of them. Um, specifically addressing the two-year college and ours, the Promise Program. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the, the foundation for that. Every graduating senior from South County is eligible for that. And that is a godsend for many, many of our students. So um, I hope that it stays, that we will continue that program. But along with that, there's this problem of sometimes students take too long to go through school. They're sort of lingering. Um, they have to take classes over and repeat classes. And I think the college has really been proactive in trying to get uh, students out on time in about two years time so they can transfer or if they're in a certificate, certificated program, go uh, directly to work. Guided Pathways, exceptional program for our students to help them through the system so they're guided through, understand which courses to take, um, how to plan for their future, uh, streamline it for them. That's wonderful. That wasn't available when I was in school and it took me three years to get through uh, community college, even back in the 70s. The third thing that the uh, school did well, and I think this, I believe this is coming from the state, was getting rid of, of remedial English and math courses. Again, too many students were just lingering there, and I think it affected them. Um, uh, they uh, didn't graduate on time or didn't graduate at all. And so what they did was they 
got rid of English, remedial English, remedial math. Anyone who comes to this school goes directly into college level math and English. If they need the extra help, they have tutors. I think that's a wonderful thing to help our students out and to support them. Uh, so those are just three of a number of things that this college is doing well to help our students make it through. Thanks, Les. How about you, Anna? How would you uh, tackle that, that very large set of issues around student financial challenges? Yeah, student debt is, is really, um, you know, one of those uh, problems that is consistent throughout. I mean, even, you know, well, a lot of people are dealing with tuition increases. So debt is always an issue with higher education. But one of the things that I think about is the way that the California master plan was, was designed. I mean, to make sure that everybody who is deserving and who works hard can, can have, have a chance. When I think about how much I paid to go to San Jose State, for example, and how much you know, I paid to go to UCLA you know, 30, 25 years or so ago, I mean, I'm, I'm horrified at how much students have to pay. So clearly City College is a bargain and, and students are um, lucky to have this gym, you know. Um, but, but it's still difficult. Many of our students are, are homeless or there's homeless, you know, home, um, homelessness and um, you know, housing insecurity. So one of the things that we have to do is really look at, our, um, at what I think are our community partnerships to help us deal with the debt that City College students have. Because even though it's a good um, a buy for the money, our students are still challenged. Some of them are, um, you know, uh, they have, uh, they're single parents. Some of them are working full-time jobs. And so one of the things that I think is so important is having the sort of philanthropy that is a real feature of this caring community. And Jeff, I know you know with, with the work for the Santa Barbara City College Foundation that's doing with the Promise Program, that needs to be cloned. We need to find ways to have other um, you know, groups in the community step up. And I know they're willing because they know how important City College is. It provides a workforce for our community. So again, you know, how can we help with, um, you know, with assisting our students to make it through? I mean, I think as a trustee, one of the things we could do is try to find out what, what monies are existing. So we need to do things, um, you know, for example, like um, you know, work study, really take advantage of the state funding like the CARES Act, although with the limitation on um, undocumented students, we have to do some other other things. But um, I think we have to try to find um, internships. So when you talk about community partnerships, what are some of the ways that we can leverage those relationships to help um, our students do better? And, and I think one of the things that we can do to, to make up for the um, uh, the decline in internationals and out of area students funding to help uh, to help with with some of the budget concerns is you know maybe think about how this COVID moment can um, uh, have us utilize and return some of the international students online and then make up for some of that because they won't have the physical footprint but we can still have those students here so larger classes include international students and you know again really leverage our, our, the goodwill of our community to help our students through some of these really uh, difficult uh, decisions. But I definitely think that funding and student debt are so serious, but you know, we have to be a little bit more proactive. I mean, and then also in terms of partnerships that really help with student debt, when I think about um, our professional schools, um, there's the you know, cottage um, hospital and the medical professions that can really help our students get the practical training that they need, right? And also the business community. Um, there's you know, so much the culinary industry and our students you know, learning how to, how to address the, the, the issues of the hospitality. Because COVID's gonna be over, we're gonna go out and we're gonna be eating and we want our students to be able to like have those jobs, you know, form those, those, those uh, new restaurants and all that. So you know, we really have to sort of look at making sure that as a, as a school, our educational mission doesn't um, add more debt to, to what the students are experiencing. So, you know, I think there's much that we can do. It's a difficult situation right now, but I really look forward to, you know, having the students really thrive at City College and have some of the benefit of having affordable education that I had and not be saddled with these unreasonable astronomical uh, um, student loans. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're, we're in the final, final moments here. We're gonna, we're gonna go to a lightning round. I'm gonna ask you to uh, respond very briefly. Let's, let's try for 30 seconds maybe. 
Um, to a two-part question, you've heard it with your uh, fellow area candidates. So it, it goes like this. Um, as you have watched the board, uh, given you're, neither of you are incumbents to the board, but you've certainly seen the board in action over the years. Uh, what is something that you've seen that you really appreciated that you'd like to compliment uh, the board's work? Uh, or and, and then what is something that you were very critical of or you, you have a criticism of that the board has done? Uh, and I'll start uh, with you on that one. And me? Yes. Yes. Um, well, okay. Well, first of all, um, I definitely think hiring Dr. Goswami was a, definitely something that the board did well. Um, I also think that uh, adopting that resolution 18 was really, um, you know, so important because at this moment, it just says that, you know, we hear you, we understand that there's work to be done. I think that was a really good, um, a good first step. And we have to hold the the, um, the 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 campus and the administration accountable, and the president. Um, also, um, I I think that the uh, you know doing that study um, and really doing some uh, true assessing of what some of the issues are and learning how to what the students are all feeling, you know, and how we can make everybody feel welcome. I think that was a good a good move. I don't have a complaint uh, because when I watch the um, when I watch the board uh, meetings. I really enjoy the interaction and, you know, the, the fact that people are, you know, willing to have, uh, you know, differences of opinion. Um, but I just, I, I really think that, uh, that there is more that can be done around addressing some of these hard questions, but I don't have any complaints yet. You know, right. Let me go on the board and then see which ones I find that I can help. Fair enough, fair enough. See, no, nobody wants to critique the board tonight. That's all right. Um, so, uh, Celeste, do you have something you'd like to uh, call out as good work on the board and maybe something you'd like to uh, critique from the board? I have to agree with Anna. Um, Dr. Kaswami was just, a, a, just a, a gem of a selection from by the Board of Trustees. They got it right. But along with that, I need to include Dr. Helen Benjamin, who was our interim um, college president uh, until Dr. Kaswami came on. And that was a very, very difficult time those months. And she was exceptional at the helm. Um, I just applaud the board for that decision as well. I don't really have any criticisms. The only thing that I would say is what I especially admire about the board today is that um, it's, it's, politically, uh, it's a politically well-balanced board, which means that they work together, they come together with different points of view, different perspectives, they debate them, they consider them, they question them, and then they come to a resolution. And I would hope to see that we continue to have that political balance maintained on the board um, in the future, this election, and also in all future elections. It's important that the entire community be represented on the board, both the college community, but also the greater community at large. Okay, thank you both. So we are now down to final uh, closing statements. Anything you want to say about yourselves, your candidacy, uh, anything we didn't cover tonight? I know we, we didn't have uh, time to cover everything. So uh, I want to give you both a chance to do that. And I want to take your, uh, your comments in the same order uh, as we opened with. Um, so uh, Celeste, I will start with you, Ms. Barber. Okay. I'd like to address briefly the pledge incident that occurred at a trustees meeting in January 2019 and explain why I have stated repeatedly throughout the campaign, I want politics taken out of education. An important role of the community college is to anticipate what services our changing student population will require before they even fill out an admissions application. Post pandemic, that role is more vital than ever and will require the full attention of the board. First, the issue was not about the Pledge of Allegiance. What was in jeopardy was our First Amendment right to speak in a public place. I did recite the pledge. Board President Miller and the trustees respected my right to do so. It was when audience members began shouting and demanding that I be cut off that one individual's right to free speech was threatened. Ironically, those who attempted to silence one person that day had little understanding that their actions were also serving to undermine their own right to speak and to peacefully assemble along with that. The First Amendment protects us from the federal government, but also from the mob. And its protections extend to every person who sets foot on American soil, regardless of citizenship status or station in life. I hope that you will sit in on a board meeting occasionally. While there, look to the left, over to the doorway where you entered. 
You'll notice that the door remains open throughout the meeting. There are no guards present. People will enter late. Others will walk out during the meeting. Nobody is denied entry. Everyone is welcome to walk in, fill out a speaker's card, and address the board during public comment or to an agenda item. That scenario, open governance, is rare in the world even today. It's a precious right that we must never take for granted and never permit anyone else to trample. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celeste. Uh, Anna, final, final thoughts, final words. Closing statement uh, is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, I really thank you and the foundation, you know, for this opportunity to speak to voters. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just been great. And I thank all of the folks who signed on to the webinar for being here. Uh, this, this conversation is really important, uh, but I think I'm the best candidate for this job because I think I'm the most qualified. I have higher education experience as both a teacher and a successful administrator. My community values and my volunteer work and my engagements are solid. And, and that's why I'm backed by our local leaders, Mayors Perotti and Murillo, our supervisors and council members. I'm endorsed by Planned Parenthood, the Democratic Party, Democratic Women, Young Democrats, the California School Employees Association, the Central Coast Labor Council and others. Uh, I, I'm a team player, but I stand up for my core beliefs, even if unpopular. And I believe that my fundraising experience at Stanford University when I was a staffer in their major gifts program would really come in handy in talking about a fundraising to help through this pandemic economy right now. So, you know, one of the things that I think is so crucial too is that my history as a first generation college student who benefited from the community college um, experience. And so I know I can inspire city college students. So um, also now that I'm retired, I'm really looking forward to becoming a lot more involved with City College's offerings for lifelong learners. So I'm especially looking forward to taking some classes in gardening. I just took it up and it's a, ha it's a habit that I'm really excited about. So um, I love posting images of my herbs and small plants growing on Facebook. So, you know, I'm really excited about getting that level of engagement with City College as well. But I wanna thank you again for this opportunity and I would really be honored to have your vote for me because I know I can do the job well. And please go to my website, Everett, the number four, sbcc.com to learn more about me and um, what I hope and my values are. So thank you, Jeff. Thank the foundation. And I enjoyed this. Thanks, thank Celeste. <laughs> Good to see you too. Anna. I want to thank you both, Anna Everett, Celeste Barber, for spending the time with us tonight uh, in covering uh, all of these range of issues. Um, and I want to now offer everyone a chance to come back on screen for a moment if they'd like as I close up here. Uh, let me give a few final announcements and, and shout outs. Uh, once again, this was part of our campus conversations. We've been doing this uh, now for several months through the pandemic. We find it a valuable way to connect our community to our community's college. I want to thank everybody who joined us this evening for being part of that. Um, on behalf of the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Raisa Smarl, who uh, was running the, the tech and making the magic work tonight, as well as uh, Jennifer LeMay, who does all of our outreach and marketing, and we'll make sure that this is posted, um, nice, cleanly edited, and then posted on our website for future viewing uh, as well. I also want to encourage all of you uh, to go to the college's page. There is a page on the election, and we have all of our six candidate statements there, as well as other reports uh, on their campaigns. Uh, we also have local media who've been covering this race and, and offered all six of our candidates a chance to answer questions. Uh, and uh, we have that from News Hawk, Santa Barbara Independent, Santa Barbara News Press, and others. And tonight I want to thank in particular KEYT, KCRW, and the Santa Barbara uh, uh, News Hawk, rather, for, um, for being our co-promoters of this event. And of course, all of you who, who uh, joined us tonight. And again, just a reminder, uh, I want uh, to acknowledge uh, Ron Lichty and, and Robert Miller for Area 2. Uh, remember, election's coming up November 3rd. If you're in Area 2, you get a chance to vote, please do. Uh, for Area 3, we have Veronica Gallardo and we have Aaron Garenia. Again, Area 3 folks, this is your chance. These are your candidates. Please, please vote. And in Area 4, we have Anna Everett and Celeste Barber. Please, please vote if you live in Area 4 for one of these two fine folks. Um, thank you all for making this possible, and uh, I wish you all a very pleasant evening, and then best to you in the election. Thank you.